Hello guys, and welcome back to Bright Pandas Talk from Temi, an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. I'm your host, Matt Wickham, and today guys, we've got with us Mo, co-founder at Gadget. Mo, hello, how are you? Hey, good. Yourself? Good, thank you. Good. Mo, um, before we get into the midst of everything, I want to get to know you a little bit, but I always say this at the beginning of our podcast to get to know the leaders uh, and the people behind the machine. So tell me something, Mo, about yourself, uh, which not many people know about you. One one interesting special fact. Uh, in the mornings, I still have those, uh, did you know about the cheese strings that you kind of, <laughs> as a child, would uh, string and then you know, I still have one of those every morning before I go to work. Every Growing morning. Up. Every morning, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> I love a cheese string as well. So I don't yeah. blame you. I don't have one every morning. Uh, I live here in Ukraine, and I actually haven't found anything similar, which is very, very upsetting. Um, Mo, okay, cool. Let's get started. Tell me, uh, in a few sentences, just for our listeners, what is it that you do at Gadget? Give us a rundown. Yeah, so I am the co-founder and CEO of Gadget. We're a seed stage uh, startup that's building a app development platform for uh, JavaScript developers. Uh, so uh, when they want to build web apps, there's a bunch of nonsense work they do over and over again. And our platform aims to handle that for them so that they can kind of build more, build faster in less time, mm -hmm. maintain less and and just kind of uh, be more productive day to day. Uh, so we sell that software suite to uh, today. We're focused on e-commerce app development. Uh, so we sell the software suite to uh, uh, big brands, agencies, and freelancers that uh, you know customize uh, e-commerce stores on various platforms. Uh, so that's kind of our focus today. And uh, like I said, my role is to lead the company effectively. But uh, because we're small, I'm mostly focused on product and go to market these days. So I'm pretty okay. involved in the day-to-day -day decision making. So, mate, you've been going now for, correct me if I'm wrong here, two years, around two years, 10 months, almost three years now. Um, were you obviously the co-founder? Were you the, the guy with the, the idea or did you jump on uh, to the idea? Who are you in, in this journey? So it was uh, the initial idea was my co-founder, Harry's. Uh, it was slightly different. It was for a different audience. And uh, I think through the course of a set of conversations we had, uh, Initially, he wanted to build a no-code tool for non-developers, but as we talked about it more and more, we both just kind of felt that writing code was still very much the best way for building web software when the code you're writing is unique. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just terrible when the code you're writing has been written 10 million times before. And so instead of no code, we reshifted it and we kind of decided like, let's just focus on developer productivity. Um, uh, so the initial idea I would say was his, and then we kind of refined it over time and landed on uh, what it is we've landed on today. Nice. Okay, let's start with that. Let's uh, start with talking with you about you and uh, Harry, your co-founder. Yeah. Um, how did you two get acquainted at the beginning? Did you know yeah. each other before this? We did. We did. Uh, so I, um, Harry and I used to work together at uh, Shopify, which was a big e-commerce tech giant. Uh, I used to run one of the uh, product teams at Shopify that was responsible for financial services. And Harry was uh, running uh, engineering for the core infrastructure of the company. And uh, because I used to manage the checkout and Harry uh, and Shopify's checkout is a nightmare of throughput mm -hmm. and engineering challenges. Mm -hmm. And Harry was uh, incredibly helpful in helping me get, keep checkout up and running. We kind of met there, you know, learned to trust each other there and work with each other there. And uh, I think it was two, three years after we both left Shopify that uh, he reached out to me out of thin air and uh, made an outlandish statement that uh, he had a framework that he thought would help any app scale to infinity without the app developer having to worry about any infrastructure. And typically a statement like that I wouldn't take seriously, but because I had five years of work history with Harry and 
some of the engineering challenges we worked on at Shopify were truly cutting edge. Um, like some of the flash sales that happened on that platform, millions of people will hit a website at the same millisecond trying to buy the only five sneakers that, you know, Kanye West has decided to sell that day. And so I had a lot of confidence in Harry and I was more inclined to hear him out. And I always think about that. I think if I didn't know him and I didn't trust him, I would never take that call. That sounds silly. Uh, but because I knew him and I trusted him, I took his call and I, we talked for months and we decided to start a company together. Mo, tell me a little bit more about that because obviously many of our listeners now, they are either startup founders or they are looking to go in, onto this journey. How do you know when to kind of jack in the job, the the safe job that's giving you lots of money, that's giving you lots of safety to take this venture and and just go for it? What was for you the moment which you thought, okay, I'm going to do it because? Yeah. So I, I'll preface this by saying that maybe my situation isn't going to be representative of the average person's. Uh, working at a company at very early uh, years at a company like Shopify, you kind of get a nice safety net financially, and that makes decisions like this way less stressful than the average viewer of your podcast, I assume. And so I just want to preface it by saying that I don't think the way I went about it is how most people go about it. Uh, in my case, what happened was I had... Um, left Shopify to take some time off and um, found that incredibly boring and uh, started doing consulting just to, you know, kill time, um, but then found that incredibly boring. And I think in that boredom, I kind of realized something about myself that I need a challenge. And if I don't have a challenge in life, I'm kind of dislodged and I don't know what I'm doing day to day. And so uh, at some point I started kind of like, okay, I need to find what's next. I can't just sit on a couch and do some consulting and, you know, hang around all day. And it was just serendipity. Harry called. He had a crazy idea that was hard. It was challenging. It spoke to me. It was technical. Um, it's the type of thing I like working on, which is like a brand new invention as opposed to uh, uh, iterating on something that already exists in the world. And so, uh, it just spoke to me and I said, I jumped on it. I think my advice to others would be, you need a lot of conviction in whatever it is you're about to do to actually do it because things won't go great at times. And the only thing that keeps you going is that conviction. So I think the single biggest tipping point has to be the conviction. Like the, the moment you can't keep your job because you're so sure that you're right about something and you should build it is probably the moment you should quit your job and go build it because that's when you have the conviction to overcome the challenges you're going to face. Um, and also you won't be able to stay at your job. Like the urge to quit and do this thing that you're sure is right will just drive you out. So uh, I don't know if that's a great heuristic for everyone. I'm sure there's other factors like money and other things that need to be considered. From my position, it was really conviction. It's like, do I believe that every developer in the world is doing software development wrong? Yes. Okay, great. Let me go correct it. But if I don't believe that to my bones, this is going to be a very painful journey and I should not do it. Amazing. Mo, uh, you've made my job so much easier because now I know the headline and the title for our uh, for our video today, Conviction. Tell us a little bit more about you and Harry. So what kind of advice could you give to uh, other leaders out there who are working with a co-founder? Because it's a very difficult thing to do. You're pretty much in a relationship. Yeah. Um, well, definitely in a relationship. And how, how do you make it work? Because do you have to find someone who is the opposite or can you work if someone is similar? What What are you and Harry? Personality wise, we're very much opposites. And then in terms of like skill sets, often we overlap. Um, and there's pros and cons to both of those things. So, you know, overlapping skill sets means easier communication, but also it means that the skills you both don't have, neither of you have. Um, being different is helpful. I think uh, we counterbalance each other. He's like the yin to my yang. Uh, 
But I would say the relationship uh, is incredibly important. Um, probably the most important thing, and it's easy to lose sight of that, that um, unless you don't need your co-founder, in which case, why are you co-founders? You need your co-founder and you need them to be happy and stay and be healthy and productive. And so as you're going through the challenges of a company, which will inadvertently get you into conflict with your co-founder, how do you manage to keep it chugging along? I think what happened for me was I got married right around when, or I, I got engaged and then married right around when I started this company with Harry. And I kind of see the similarities where it's like, it's kind of like a marriage. Okay. Uh, like we have a goal and we are together until that goal is, it's kind of like a marriage with a child. It's like, we have a child together. We have to make this work and we are going to make this work because we want to see this child get to a certain stage. That's how I would describe a relationship with my co-founder. It's like having a wife, a kid, and, you know, for the sake, and, you know, there are good times and bad times, but for the sake of the kid, there's always like a shared path. Um, the best thing uh, I've gotten in terms of advice is to just... Uh, when you're getting into a argument, maybe p take a moment and ask yourself, and this was actually advice at my wedding that I now use at work, uh, is this more important to me or my partner? And then decide, are you gonna pick that fight? Because you know, there's a million fights in a day when you're starting a startup and you should just pick and choose the ones that really matter and are worth the turmoil of the fight. And not the little ones that like, you know, maybe you're right, but your co-founder really cares. And so you just let it go. Okay. Interesting. Um, Mo, tell me right back in the beginning. So almost three years ago, what did the MVP look like? Uh, it didn't look like anything. It was so, uh, when we started, there was no MVP. This is one of those companies that like, unfortunately you have to spend a lot of time building the MVP even. So the MVP was ready a year and a half in. Um, and uh, I think when we started years ago, what we were doing is largely mock-ups and kind of like click-throughs that are demos and and recording people's kind of behaviors in the product and building it out. Uh, but we did not raise funds until a year into our project because we, our bet, ultimately is that the problem with software development is that there's too many disparate tools and developers need to stitch them together over and over and over again every time they do anything and they waste time doing that and so what we're trying to do is give you a stack where all the talk tools talk to each other and so inadvertently the part of the challenge is we have to build the entire stack because our bet is that the whole is mm -hmm. much greater than the sum of the parts that you can compose yourself and that type of product is just very hard to like get to a demo in a month because it's like, well, you're building a database company, a coding company, a text editor company, uh, 15 companies all at once. And until they're all kind of done, you don't really have a story. Uh, so I would say uh, early days, we just had mockups on wh Whimsical and, uh, and we were building while we were testing user interfaces on various users. Interesting. So... Uh in those early days, in those early months, who and how did you work on it? Who did you have working on it? How did you have working on it? Was it, you said you're quite a small team here at the beginning. Um, oh, it was just me and Harry. Just building the infrastructure for the, uh, the stack. The MVP, the initial MVP for the first nine months, it was just Harry and I, I would say. Um, so it was... Every decision, every product decision, we would just kind of go back and forth on. It was good because he had a very like deep technical uh, background. Then I had a kind of uh, stronger user experience, or or, or uh, and kind of like teach them the framework quickly background. And and so we would debate everything together. We would then prototype a few things in Whimsical together, show it to people, get feedback, build what we felt somewhat confident in. And I think around like the ninth month, uh, we had gotten a little bit of seed money from a few people who knew us and we started hiring people around month eight, nine. Uh -huh. uh, it was around then that we realized like if we just try to build the MVP, the two of us, we're going to be here for 10 years. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Tell me um, about that journey. So uh, how many people have you got now? We are 22 people now. 
Nice, 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 nice. Tell me, with that challenge, obviously you worked in product, you were saying in Shopify before. Um, yeah. First time founder, how yeah. has that uh, experience working in product at Shopify, how has that helped you? What have you used from your knowledge from that to help you uh, as CEO in this company, Gadget? Uh, a, a ton. I, um, as a product manager, I, I would say product managers, typically there's like two types. There's the ones that work on new products. And then there's the ones that like work on iterating on an existing product and making it better. Throughout my career, I had a lot of experience with both, but primarily I'm the type of product manager that gets assigned to something new. And that is great experience if you're starting a new company because the uh, experience of starting new is very similar. There's no one who wants to talk to you. No one cares about you. No one knows who you are. And basically your your initial challenge is to like generate conversations. Uh -huh. You know, because without conversations, you have no data. And without data, you have nothing. And no one cares about you because you don't exist yet. And so you learn uh, how to go about, you know, creating enough of something valuable that you can earn the right to ask someone for their time, for feedback, to take a look at what you just did and say, okay, I think that's neat. Here's what I think you should do next. Um, you learn, you know... Um, that's in zero to one, which the type of product management I'm kind of talking about, uh, really there is a blank canvas in front of you and there's almost too many directions you can go in. And because there's too many directions, you kind of learn some tricks for how to like box yourself in almost where it's like, it's a bit liberating to have some constraints and give yourself constraints really quickly. So zero to one product management is really helpful for a founder. And then towards the end of my career at Shopify, I was also a general manager uh, sure. where I was managing kind of the uh, the entire 130, 40 person uh, financial services team. So engineers, sales, ops, design, product, everyone. And that gave me a lot of experience in terms of just like managing uh, people who are not of the same job as myself. Mm -hmm. that's a tricky thing it's like your entire career you start off managing no one then you manage people who are only doing the job you've done and then suddenly one day when you get really really senior you start managing a bunch of people whose job you've never done and that is very challenging because somehow you're supposed to give them feedback somehow you're supposed to help them grow you know and it's like well I've never done your job and how do I get good at helping you get good at a job I've never done so Things like that came in really handy and still to this day come in handy. So what would you say, Mo, if there are some PMs, uh, project managers listening to this right now, uh, and they're thinking of taking that jump, they've got a good idea, maybe. Um, what would you say is generally the one thing that PMs lack before becoming an entrepreneur, before becoming a, a CEO? What is, what is it that you lacked and probably, no, actually, let's go, what is it that generally most of them lack, uh, which you would see obviously um, in Gadget as well? What would you see which they lack, which now you have? I, I think, uh, and this would offend a lot of product managers, I think like in tech product management, often we like to believe that, you know, the best product always wins and product is what really matters. But I kind of have held a different view for a very long a long time that actually in zero to one distribution trumps product all day every day and really what matters is finding and owning the right distribution channels fast and early and in fact i would say the products i've built that have been really successful in the past really the clever part was the distribution trick we pulled it's not you know, the user interface or the interactions of the product and i think often product managers at tech companies undervalue that and that's what you will be faced with when you start your own company the realization that actually you can build the prettiest product in the world distribution is what you really need to figure out very early on and so um i think that's typically a bit of a wake-up call for product managers who become ceos it's like oh right this other side that i've been neglecting is actually incredibly important and depending on what you're building often more important than getting the product perfect 
I like to say like getting the product right almost just earns you a ticket to the show, but it doesn't guarantee that you win anything. You know, like build a great product. Cool. You are allowed to talk to a customer, but in order to win a customer, you need great distribution and uh, great products don't win customers just on their own. I already see so many quotes for this uh, interview. It's perfect. <laughs> yes. Tell me, Mo, with this, obviously lots of challenges have come, I can imagine. Um, tell me about the biggest pivots you have had to make as a company. Uh, we have not pivoted per se, but a few times have kind of changed our core framework which is really challenging to do when you're building developer products because other people are relying on that framework to be stable while they build on top. So in the early years, that was incredibly painful because you kind of come up with a framework and it's supposed to be stable. And then six months later, you're like, oh, we got it wrong and we need to change it. And unfortunately, this change is going to be painful, not just for us, but everyone who's built on top of the old version of our framework. And so that type of stuff was really incredibly painful in the first couple of years. And I would say like building platforms and Gadget is a platform, like it's a tool that pumps out to apps. It is not an app itself. Uh, building platforms comes with that nasty challenge of like you're trying to abstract something and figuring out what parts of it to hide, what parts of it to show so that people can still build what they're trying to build just faster. Really, really tricky problem. And we would constantly get that wrong. And then there's a mess of how to clean it up just because of how deep in our product these changes were. So I wouldn't call those a pivot per se, but I would just say like major product missteps that we had to correct that were incredibly painful. Okay. Tell me, um, at the beginning, so... First time founder, at the beginning, I'm sure you had a lot of advice from a lot of people telling you how they think you should do it, how it should work out. Um, what was the worst bit of advice you've been given? The worst advice? Worst bit of advice. I find most of the advice. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think investors are great for, you know, connections, money, a little bit of feedback, but really you're thinking about your business eight to 10 hours a day and they're thinking about your business 10 seconds a day and there's no situation in which they should have phenomenal advice that blows your mind unless they heard it from some other company that's very similar to yours, but that's rare. And so I, I think often founders should go with their gut and what their customers are telling them, not with their investors. The worst advice, what, who gave me terrible advice? I uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. So I'm just going to say at some point, one of our investors asked if we wanted to raise at a valuation that was just ridiculously low and tried to pitch us on why we should do it. And... Uh, it made absolutely no sense. Honestly, it's not even a great story. I'll, I'll pass on this question. I don't know. No problem. It was just terrible advice in terms of like, you should raise at this valuation and made absolutely no sense. Tell me then, if that's the worst advice, what's been the best advice you've got? The best advice I've gotten is to be incredibly picky about the first 20 to 50 employees. Uh -huh. Because... 20 to 50 employees, should we be successful and grow to 100 or 500 or 1,000 or IPO someday? They act as the future leaders of the company. They set the culture. Their behaviors are the behaviors other employees will observe. And so really, uh, the advice was, unfortunately, most founders are busy with product market fit at that stage. But really what determines your culture forever is probably who are your first 50 and 100 people and how do they behave. Did you just get it right, Mike? I'm only at 22. So, well, 70, 78 more and we'll find out. But the uh, first 20. They're great. Yeah, they're fantastic. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, so be incredibly picky with your initial hires and not compromising and sticking to your guns when your gut says, hey, there's a yellow flag or a red flag in the interview. Just pass, you know, wait for the right person to show up. Okay. 
Tell me, uh, you were saying at the beginning that you took some time off from Spotify uh, before you went into this role. Um, if you didn't take this role, where do you think you would be now? What would you be doing? Would you be in entrepreneurship? Were you an entrepreneur in yourself before? Where would you be? Um, I would say after Shopify, I would have... So initially, I thought I was just going to take some time off and I, that was not for me. Uh, I, I understand that I need something to keep me busy now. Uh, I've always had small side businesses, just advising, consulting. Uh, I potentially was going to consider being an investor, but didn't really enjoy that either. I think realistically what would have happened is I would have sat around and waited for either the first company with a crazy good idea that I'm too tempted to work on or the first friend who wants to start a company to basically kind of pitch me something that gets me off my couch. Uh, and that's ultimately what happened with Harry. You know, I did take job uh, calls at that time as well. You know, they didn't get me out of the couch. The conversation with Harry got me out of the couch. So I think I probably would have just kept doing that until something got me excited and wanting to leave the house and, you know, working again. And you imagine yourself now ever going back to work for someone else? Absolutely not. Yeah, um, I think I, I think I see now that I love this and I'm made for this. And I like the challenges and the stress. I love all of it. And uh, I would like to not work for anyone ever again. Interesting. Um, tell me, if you love the challenges and all the stress, out of 10, from one being the worst, ten being the best. From this year's success, where would you mark this year's success for Gadget? Seven. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. What would you have to do to make make it a ten? Uh, we're at the kind of awkward early go to market phase, so uh, like I would say a ten would be we have figured out how to predictably acquire our customers. We acquire customers semi unpredictably right now. And to me, the marker of like, okay, we know how our business works is like when you can predict, I'm going to do this, it's going to generate this many signups and of them, this many will convert and this is how long it'll take. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's like true product market fit. And so that would be a 10. Nice. If you can predictably say, this is where I find my people. This is how I get them to sign up. And this percentage of them I know will punch in a credit card and convert to a customer. Nice. That, if we could do that predictably, we would be a 10, yes. Okay. Um, just two more questions for you here. So you were saying there that you uh, work with e-commerce uh, a lot at the moment. What, uh, in this industry, where do you think the future is going? Where do you feel and see the future over the next couple of years with e-commerce? Uh, I think the main trends that have kind of been playing out will continue playing. So multi-channel where brands are increasingly just everywhere. Right, they're online, they're in store, they're in some other partner stores as well. They're doing a pop up randomly at a local fair. That trend, I think, which has started playing out three, four years ago, I assume will continue. Uh, and we won't really see these silos of like big box store versus retail store versus online store. It'll all just kind of blur. Uh, I think uh, with fulfillment as well, we'll probably see like even more maybe in the uk you folks have uh, a lot of this already but in canada we we don't have this quite yet but even more like fulfillment partnerships where you can just pick up anything anywhere you know you bought it online from this random store you go to your gas station and you pick it up uh i think there will be a propagation of that uh and then i think um Apple's rules around uh, privacy have made advertising really expensive for e-commerce brands because uh, the they relied on how Apple was doing cookie management in the past and that. And so uh, a shift to uh, from direct to consumer e-commerce brands to learn how to acquire customers through other means because for too long they've been dependent on, you know, buy an ad, acquire a customer, or try to retain them. And now they're kind of forced to, okay, explore new distribution channels because ads got really expensive overnight. They got 300% more expensive. So find new, clever 
approaches to getting a customer to buy a product and you're seeing a lot of like new apps and new technologies and new user interfaces being designed to like convince people to buy something more mm -hmm. than just like ad showing up on Instagram. Uh, so I think those three trends uh, would probably continue for some time. Okay. And last question for you, Mo. Um, last question and last thought for all of the people listening to this. What do you want our listeners to leave with in this podcast? What do you want them to remember about Gadget? The last remaining thoughts about Gadget. What would it be? About Gadget, it would be that um, in spite of what the world might tell you, web software development is not nearly as complicated as it's been made out to be. It is only cost prohibitive and expensive because we have ordered ourselves with the tools, languages, and libraries we've chosen to use, and that there is a faster, cheaper, and better way out there. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. Mo, thank you very much, everybody. Mo, CEO and co-founder at Gadget, thank you for coming on, Mo. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me.